So, without more ado, let me uh, introduce uh, our lecturer. So, Jane Den Hollander is the perfect speaker for Chef's international audience. Um, she grew up in South Africa, uh, did her PhD in Wales, and pursued her academic career in Australia. She's recently retired after nine years as Vice Chancellor of Deakin University in Australia. And under her leadership, Deakin grew in international stature. At Chef, we know Jane because she came in person, and we were very honoured about this, to sign a dual PhD agreement between Chef and Ready. And she has given us terrific support for the development of research and education links with Deakin which have now been extended to a priority partnership between Deakin, not just Chef, but the whole of Aarhus University. Deakin is renowned for the way under her leadership, the university developed expertise in IT and used its resources to drive the transformation of the local town of Geelong from industrial decline to a hub of innovation. Deakin is a leader in the development of IT in education and has used this to expand opportunities, not least for women, with a cloud of 13,000 online students, if my figures are up to date. Such amazing achievements in fostering equality, not least for women, and within the university as well as in society, are now put in jeopardy in many parts of the world by the way the COVID-19 pandemic has been handled. This is the subject of Jane's uh, chef lecture with the title, How to Ensure Women's Participation in the COVIDian Era. Over to you, Jane. Susan, thank you so much for the introduction and of course, for the invitation to be with you. It's an absolute delight to be here. I begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from the lands of the Noongar peoples of Western Australia. I pay my respects to them most particularly their elders past and present, noting that their land has never been ceded by them and never will be. I acknowledge Her Excellency Mary Ann Miller, Mary Ellen Miller, Australian Ambassador to Denmark, and also the Pro-Rector of Aarhus University, Professor Berit Eicher. I thank the Centre for Higher Education Futures, Professor Susan Wright, and Associate Baron Professor Soren Bengston of the School of Education at Aarhus for this invitation to speak with you today. And I fondly acknowledge former colleagues, colleagues from Deakin University, from Ready, and in particular Ursula Lorenzen, who leads the Europe, who leads the Europe arm of Deakin University and is based in Copenhagen. And finally, I note that this conversation occurs at a very anxious and sad time in our individual and collective histories as we join here on the Zoom virtual meeting in the midst of a pandemic. We grieve for those who are ill and we grieve for those who have been lost. So I begin by recalling where I was when this era of COVID began. I had retired, as, you, as you've heard, as Vice Chancellor of Deakin University in Australia in late 2019, after about 35 years of senior leadership in university administration. And like many women, my career has taken more than its fair share of twists and turns. Upon arriving home in Perth, across the other side of the vast country that is Australia, I was approached to be the interim vice chancellor of the University of Western Australia to cover a gap between a departing vice chancellor and a commencing new one. I was assured it was a three month appointment. I gave it a brief thought, three months late summer in early 2020. It would allow me to reintroduce myself to my home state of Western Australia after a long time away. What could possibly go wrong? One week after I commenced in early February as the interim vice chancellor, the world stopped and we all looked up in consternation. My friends, it was Lennon who said, in some decades, nothing happens and in some weeks, decades happen. Everything changed everywhere, it seemed. And so it was for us that the University of Western Australia in the far Western corner of Australia, in the deep global South of our universe, the record will show that in six weeks, one of the most conservative universities in Australia, with no online tuition to speak of, 
moved every unit of study, over 3,000, to full online mode, including all assessment and all examinations. In some weeks, decades definitely do happen, and across the world our universities went digital in what was a blink of an eye in order to better serve their students and to keep their doors open. Our critics often talk of the indifferent culture in our wider global education sector that we cannot change and that if and when we do, we do it acrimoniously. And it's true and I've often said that culture eats strategy for breakfast every day. But when the chips are down, a strong culture will join and work to reach safe harbour. UWA staff did that, and my part in that is something I will cherish. I hope that our strong culture will help us now. I mention this experience at UWA as it has given me a clearer view of the issues we now face as university staff, and particularly as women in academe in the face of COVID-19 and its destruction. The Covidian era will be a longish one by all accounts. This virus is smart and persistent, and it is likely considerable time will pass be before we find a way to either live with it or somehow destroy it. The current view globally is that the impact of COVID-19 will set women's progress in the workplace back with little to no recovery for some considerable time. In April 2020, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, said, and I quote, the gendered impact of COVID-19 needs immediate action to avoid the devastating social and economic consequences for women and girls. And in August 2020, the Honourable Maurice Payne, Defence Minister and Minister for Women in the Australian Government, spoke at a job creation forum focused on women and she said, and I quote, we know crises affect men and women differently. She then went on to list the COVID-19 issues that Australia was dealing with. The rise of domestic violence, the safety of women working at the health frontier in hospitals, in aged care and in childcare, the employment insecurity of women in the retail and hospitality industries, which had effectively shut down in Australia and the proportion of women who work part-time and in casual arrangements suddenly even more vulnerable as our global supply chains collapsed everywhere. Also at that conference, Libby Lyons, the Chief Executive Officer of the Australian Workplace Gender Equality Agency, expressed her concern that equality will suffer as the community emerges from the pandemic and that this would not be good for productivity. She quoted from a recent key report, the Bankwest Curtin University Report 2020, into the business case for gender equity. This showed evidence of a causal relationship between increasing women's participation in leadership and company performance. The evidence, evidence indicated better performance, greater productivity, and greater profitability when there was gender equity and balance. She also noted the absence of sufficient, or indeed any, childcare to support home workers, particularly women who work and have caring responsibility. It was during this very same period that Australia's publicly funded universities learned that they were not eligible for financial support from the Australian government. To our collective chagrin, the government actually altered pandemic-specific legislation known as JobKeeper three times to ensure that no publicly funded university was able to access support funds to supplement the significant financial losses caused by the rapid border closures here and fewer international students. By May, there was a collapse in most Australian universities' discretionary cash and forward estimates. This series of events has impacted university academic and professional staff, most particularly in the junior and middle ranks of academe, where contracts and casualisation are significant employment levers. Thousands of staff began losing their jobs and their livelihoods in April, after the first semester census date had been concluded. That was August, and now, in late October, what has been the impact of the pandemic on women's participation at the national level? Sadly, the predictions have come to pass. 
In Australia, women have been hardest hit, losing their jobs at about twice the rate of men and now less likely to be re-employed than men. Alongside this, the recent pandemic-driven tax cuts by our federal government have benefited the highest paid. This inequitable action has meant women are disproportionately affected as they mostly are not the highest paid workers in Australia or indeed in most parts of our world. Closer analysis of the budget has led to comments of a pink recession in Australia. A recession, a pink recession, is one that affects women disproportionately, mostly because they work in the services sector, which has not been funded as well as other sectors in this pandemic. For example, two billion Australian dollars has been allocated to stimulate the conduction, construction industry, and a further two billion has been put towards roadworks, both industries um, are male dominated and employ about 99% men. By contrast, just 200 million, a tenth, was allocated to women's employment and childcare support. There was also reduced investment in social housing and very reduced investment in support for victims of domestic violence, which is at record highs in Australia and, as I understand it, across Europe. So, at the national level in Australia, women are losing work faster, not benefiting as much from pandemic budget levers, and prospects for older women are dire indeed, as they have been disproportionately affected. Homelessness and domestic violence are rising fast and are topics on our news every day. Our Australian higher education sector has been wounded. Right now, well over 15,000 higher education workers have lost their jobs, and the prediction is for this to continue to grow in 2021. Many of these are women. They are the casual workers doing the bulk of the teaching without tenure. They are the postdocs on contract without tenure. They are mid-career researchers whose funding, grant funding is ceasing or, or has already ceased. They are the engine house of all faculty administration. It is likely now that the sector will emerge, the Australian sector will emerge with much reduced staff profiles and having lost most of the equity gains of the past decade or two. Our sector has shrunk before our eyes and women are paying the larger price at this stage. We cannot afford this. We all know, we've always known, that in most universities there has been a skew in the proportion of women and men at each academic level. In Denmark and in Australia, the junior levels on the academic ladder are mostly dominated by women, mostly not tenured. And then at about the senior lecture level, the lines cross and as if by magic, men are the majority at the higher levels up to professor and into executive management. Most university staff profiles will show this. In many universities, we have been striving very hard for years, progressing incrementally to improve the relative proportions at each level on the academic ladder. A significant strategy in Australia has been to specifically and strategically appoint women to early career researcher roles and all universities, or most of them I'm sure, have strategies to retain and encourage mid-career academic women to stay in the race, to persist, to publish, to balance home and work. I recall when I last spoke in your part of the world at the University of Copenhagen, I documented with pride and satisfaction these enabling strategies and the positive, inspiring impact they were having in Australia on increasing women's participation, particularly in research and particularly at the senior levels. The evidence was emerging of a significant uptick in visibility and contribution. My great fear now, as research funding evaporates and governments appear indifferent to the implications of women disappearing from the workforce, that the incremental and pleasing advances in academic women's employment and promotion will disappear. And I'm also concerned about our supply chain, those aspiring students and scholars and their participation. In a perverse move to encourage more people to choose science and engineering 
our Minister for Education has substantially increased the cost of humanities degrees and reduced the fee for science and engineering, even though the evidence is that humanities and science qualifications have similar rates of employment at graduation. Humanities is where many women, including our Indigenous women, including those who are socially disadvantaged in their youth, start their education. Hugely increased course fees are likely to de deter some women from participating in the education that feeds our system and populates the employment levels all the way up to the top, where there are those rarities who do actually make it, women professors, women rectors, women vice chancellors. Collectively then, we must expect that the numbers of academic women in our ranks will decline as there, as there is loss in the middle and junior, rank, junior ranks. And maybe even worse, there is potential that fewer women will consider higher education due to cost or simply because of their need for any kind of work to survive the global recession, which may be an enduring impact of this COVID era. Another impact in this pandemic quoted in a June 2020 Lancet article, pointed out that women make up just 24% of COVID-19 experts who were quoted in the media and 24% of national task force that were analysed. Invisibility persists. Many women choose epidemiology as a career. Australia has many women epidemiologists. I can think of three who occasionally are seen on our media. Unsurprisingly, Another thing, women's outputs were affected in publications as well, with fewer women being quoted as first authors in relation to COVID matters. This is apparently attributed to demands of family life during the pandemic. And it is substantiated by recent data from the US, from the UK and from Germany, which suggested women spend more time on pandemic impacted childcare and homeschooling than their partners. But none of this is new. All of this existed before this pandemic. Now, however, it looks like an existential threat if we do not pay attention and speak up. Anyone who thinks I may be exaggerating, I commend a new book edited by Professor Marian Mahat, a Melbourne University scholar. Women thriving and, Sur and surviving in academe is noteworthy and documents the experiences of academic written, women written before the pandemic. It chronicles the issues related to being a woman in academe, issues of contract uncertainty, grant application stress, tenure, unfair workloads, promotion, personal stories, compelling, recognizable and familiar. Academic women, most particularly those aspiring to go up the ladder, who do not yet have tenure, where there is no institutional plan focused on their particular recruitment or on their development, will be disproportionately affected in this crisis and will leave our sector, I am sure. This is not good for them. It is not good for men, and it is certainly not good for our society and our collective future. My friends, we are living in extraordinary times, and I do not say that lightly. We must now begin to think of what needs to be done so that we do not have a different interpretation of our safety, of how and where we work in five years time than we did at the closing of 2019 and its optimism. So how do we go forward from here, I wonder? Alongside our concerns for the great moral challenges of climate change and poverty, which remain significant for our world and cannot be set aside, we must also focus on the future of our traditions in our universities, as we will be central to assisting the solutions of our collective future. A successful world needs women as part of the solution, as thinkers and workers, as Libby Lyons and the Curtin University report so adequately said. And there's one thing we also know, if we, those in the academies, do not make the case for women in academe, no one else will. So that got me thinking about a plan. I am a vice chancellor after all. And so I reflected on the work of Jim Bendel on recovery from disasters. It is interesting and thorough work. He talks at length about adaptation 
and he uses a framework for recovery from crisis, which may be a useful tool now for our global higher education sector to plan its journey onwards and out of this era. The Brendel framework has three R's described as follows and briefly, resilience, our capacity to deal with change and adapting to shocks. Restoration, rediscovering those things that have been eroded or lost during the crisis, in our case, a pandemic. Relinquishment, letting go of those things necessary perhaps in a crisis, but that we do not see as part of our future community. And finally, reconciliation, an active co-creation of a new reality, a new way of being and a new way of working. So I took that framework and here are my broad ideas around what we need to be thinking about now. Bendel says in his first R, resilience, that without it, we cannot progress. Well, that's cheery. Academic women have down the decades established their resilience. Women have endured much to attain the highest ranks in our system, often with little love or support, yet significant contribution. Women understand adapt adaptability, resilience we have. I give you down the ages, Marie Curie, Rosalind Franklin, Dorothy Hodgkin, Elizabeth Blackburn, the only Australian women Nobel laureate, and more recently, Tu Yuyu from China, their first woman laureate, famously not acknowledged in the ranks at home and not even a member of her National Academy on the day she was announced. All have had interesting careers with twists and turns, and all of them have documented some of the struggle. The second R is restoration, and what will we keep, and what will we nurture and develop from this pandemic experience? In my view, a number of very good things have emerged. Digital is the new normal for everyone. The world in order to survive has gone completely digital. Here we are, 13 countries, I don't know how many time zones, together speaking. We are altered forever, I think, and Zoom and Teams are now the rooms in which we will probably work more often than not. This is an opportunity for women and for society if we use it meaningfully, if we use it for good. In Australia, our new normal now includes working from home, enabled by this digital connectivity that connects staff and their students. What should we do about this? In my time at UWA, many pushed back against working from home, but now eight months later, for many staff, working from home is just dandy, thank you, and there's no need to be at work every day. But those women with small children and who are labouring with their own jobs and homeschooling are watching their productivity and work, their productivity and their work environment collapse, and I'm sure they have a different view. Working from home has been a boon for many of us and it should be kept on the table. But it is not a universal solution unless there is affordable childcare for those who need it. Alongside this, the digital enablement of Zoom and Teams has seen more asynchronous work where the aim is to get the work done, not be seen to be doing it in the office, in office hours. Asynchrony, working hours that suit your circumstances, could be an excellent addition to our workplaces, particularly useful to academic and professional women and men, and to families in all of our institutions. And now if we start to be more flexible about where and when we work, what does that say about our global university real estate? I see evidence from my work that some businesses have abandoned their city premises. Some departments have now meet regularly at a shared space or a coffee shop, the work meet place of the future, perhaps. New structures and new ways of working loom for us in universities and our thousand year old culture, as we go forward, may have to rethink how and what we do. And that must be a useful conversation worth having, but it needs investigation. We must test all of these ideas with our staff, our students, and particularly with our women. What worked? What did not? What ideas have emerged? And then we must act. The third R is rel relinquishment. 
What would I see or forever in a grand relinquishment of some of the things in this crisis? Well, top of my list is women being so disproportionately affected. We must stop this immediately. It is now time to think through how our economies work and how universities in the 21st century can survive within equitable frameworks. We must not lose the incremental gains of the last decades in women's visibility and contribution. The recent Nobels, particularly in chemistry, two women together with no men winning the Nobel. With such pleasing numbers of brilliant women being suddenly acknowledged, we cannot lose this progress. Equality matters now more than it ever did. And Denmark and Australia have much to do when it comes to employment practices and representation in all levels of the academies and universities in order to better balance workload allocations and culture. Transparent and fair promotion practices also matter greatly. And because we all know that you cannot be what you cannot see, it's essential the next generation of future academics see women thriving and surviving and respected for the work they do. Arguments about childcare funding must stop in Australia. Let's relinquish thinking that this is a women's issue. It belongs to us all. It takes a village to raise a child. In Australia, it's irritating and annoying. Casual and short-term contractual employment is demoralizing and corrosive. This absolutely needs a rethink. And it's one of my great regrets as a vice chancellor was that I did not focus more on the corrosive nature of short-term contractual work. It looks uglier than it ever did, and it's causing consternation in our communities and mental health issues in our staff at all levels because of the uncertainty. Is this the right approach for our sector in a new era? And now I mention that other terrible secret, violence against women through sexual harassment is a global issue and exists in communities and our industry, as we know, is not immune. It happens in our workplaces. The ivory towers, which have proved so dangerous to so many aspiring women. If we do not act on it in straightforward ways, we will lose even more talent. Now we have an opportunity. We must relinquish old policies that worry more about public relations and institutional reputation than they do about the victim. We must have clarity of purpose in new policies and above all be courageous enough to admit to failings and act, and act on those aggressors wherever they are. This is not about PR. It's about women in our academies, in our universities. It must stop and where it is discovered, it is now time that we don't deal with it properly. In the end, it comes down to what a well-balanced university workforce of the future will look like after this pandemic is over. That is our great debate. We need to sort this out, else more and more women and men will not choose an intellectual life. They will decline to work under the precarious conditions that universities, not always through their own choice, have created for the cleverest minds in our communities. Alongside this in Australia, the real cost of research must now be acknowledged and resolved. Australian university discretionary income, generated from our great success in international student recruitment and long used to fill the gap caused by reduced government funding, is now disappearing very fast. The massive hole of cross-subsidisation of research is there for everyone to see. The victims now will be our younger researchers on their precarious short-term grants who will not have a career as there is no funding going forward. And finally, to the fourth R, reconciliation, the building of a new reality based on the trauma and experience of the pandemic. Perhaps the time has come to reconsider what that reality is. What can we deliver collectively to enable the enduring contribution that our sector must make to a smarter world? to a smarter Australia, a smarter Denmark in 2030. We need more grown up conversations about work and we need them urgently. We are, after all, when all has been said and done, we are humans, that unique manifestation of life, creativity and intellect on this one small 
blue, beautiful planet in what appears to be an empty universe. We demonstrably, we humans, have the skills to do whatever it is we aspire to. The lives and futures of our grandchildren, our granddaughters and our grandsons are depending on us sorting out our world, doing it fast and doing it collectively. My friends, thank you for listening. I wish you all good fortune and safe harbour wherever you are in our world. Thank you. Thank you, Jane, for an excellent and stimulating talk with a massive critique, but a forward-looking conclusion and a, a big challenge to all of us. Thank you very much indeed. Let me hand on to uh, Mary Ellen Miller, if you would like to make some comments and responses to that stimulating talk. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, everybody. You can hear me okay? I just want to check that. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> I always just want to be sure with these technologies. Um, thank you, Jane. Uh, I know when I last heard you speak in Copenhagen, I was, I was um, equally impressed and inspired and uh, provoked to hard thought as, as you've just made us now. And I, I say thank you very much for that incredibly um, wide-ranging and yes, very sobering uh, comments and uh, critiques, but also with some hopeful thoughts at the end there. And of course, that's uh, important for us to, to grasp hold of and, and, and think most importantly about what it is we can do uh, to address some of these. And um, I mean, I, I, I said to Sue that I'd done a, I hadn't prepared a, a speech in response. I wanted to listen to Jane's comments and then make some some comments in response and I wanted to start by uh, I guess talking speaking acknowledging the the strength of the relationship between Deakin University in particular and and um, the Danish university sector and I know that uh, Deakin works very well with both Aarhus University and the University of Copenhagen uh, and that is you know to our great benefit both in Australia and Denmark I think that that warm connection um, and I know that um, when Jane came to Copenhagen last time, she spoke also about the role of, you know, increasing women in academia, which is, you know, a, a problem in Australia in, in, and in Denmark and elsewhere. And I think that that was one of the sort of uh, moments when I started really thinking a lot about um, what is it that's happening in, in Denmark that, you know, we're not seeing the progress we would expect to see. It's, a, it's the same sort of, you know, challenges that we see in Australia and they continue to hold us back. So I guess that sort of the, the next thing I wanted to say was that even before the COVIDian era, which sounds so uh, sort of permanent, which I suppose it is actually now that we're, we're dealing so strongly uh, for such a long time with it, um, even before that, I mean, I was greatly vexed by the, the reports that constantly coming out of, you know, the World Economic Forum and the uh, yeah, you know, the WTO on gender global indexes and so forth, that we we were making such slow progress on increasing women's uh, representation in decision making and in, in women's economic empowerment and, and then, of course, uh, and ending violence against women. So these things were dragging before. And, I mean, I remember giving a speech um, prior to the COVID era saying, well, are we prepared to wait 108 years for equality, which is what, which was the figure that the World Economic Forum said last time, that, that figure bounces around. And of course, the answer is no, we're not prepared to wait that long. But now we're faced with the reality that potentially we will wait longer. And because of the impacts that, as Jane has outlined them, and they are no, they are incredibly serious on women and I think there's just no denying the particular impact of COVID on women, on, on the roles that women have in the family right through to the sort of the sectors that women are most represented in having the most, being the most heavily impacted by COVID, COVID um, restrictions. So, you know, we see all of that and then we, and then on top of that we compound the social pressures that women then bear generally bear the, the brunt of. So I certainly, you know, prior to COVID, I was already exercised about how long it was going to take to achieve gender equality. And I can assure you that I'm even more <laughs> exercised now. And I think that that's, uh, 
I guess the crux of my response is, um, you know, there's many, many things that Jane said that are that are absolutely correct. Uh, and, uh, and I think, you know, governments have limitations on what they can do to address this. But that said, I mean, I think we have to uh, take more on ourselves. And I guess in, in the sense that I'm, I'm where I'm coming from as a as somebody involved in the in the diplomatic system, the multilateral system, to me that that is the next uh, next frontier where we have to really use that that system, that mechanism to pre prevent the the eroding of the progress we've made, and indeed to push forward to reclaim and and. Uh, hasten progress once again and I think um, you know there's always lots of discussion in, in in the groups that I meet in around the kinds of pressures that we're seeing on the rules-based international order and again that was happening before COVID-19 the thing is we were in a we were moving into a precarious space uh, anyway and now we have to be even more um, vigilant and uh, proactive to try and prevent any further eroding of those of those rights and uh, you know I think one of the key things that 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 system can do is look to have women in decision making roles and um, you know as we meet today I'm delighted to think that there's only two candidates left for the position of the WTO you know the World Trade Organization Director General and they're both women so you know uh, I, I think we have a happy outcome there regardless. And, and in fact, you know, it's probably hard to overstate the significance of that because in terms of some of the things, that, as Jane touched on, I mean, I think we all agree we have to consider how do we reinvent our world uh, right from right down to the personal level and, the, and the, certainly the comments on flexibility at work certainly resonated in my own organisation, we've had a huge amount of uh, work over the last five years on women in leadership, and one of the things has been embedding flexibility at work, and there's been a huge amount of resistance to, to that, as in, uh, you know, the general response is, oh, well, flexibility is all well and good, but that job can't be done flexibly, and that job can't be done flexibly. And so, you know, this sort of these uh, false, um, uh, you know, restrictions on what, what that actually means one benefit, if we can, if we can't be too bold to say there's a benefit of COVID-19, one is that probably the sweeping away of all of that resistance to flexibility at work, uh, and that that does have implications, as Jane pointed out. It's not a straightforward positive, but on balance, it does provide. Um, it takes away one one of those small barriers. But so you know that's down at the personal level. But then I think we go right up to the global system where there is. You know, there is discussion now amongst uh, like-minded countries about how do we rebuild this system in a way that is positive, uh, you know, it, it, it supports the sovereignty of nations while it also supports global cooperation. Uh, you know, it, it ensures that small countries still have a right of say, a right of, uh, you know, protection and, and support in a global system that works for everybody mm -hmm. rather than uh, reducing and and coming back away from that to you know into protectionism and nationalism and uh, all of those things that you know seem like a safe place to go to in the middle of a crisis but have long-term negative impacts mm -hmm. so so I, I feel yeah. very, very much that the um, you know, we, if we can push hardest on women's representation in decision-making bodies, you know, and in the, elect, in the elected, in the political space as well, you know, where we're seeing uh, more and more women being elected, there's still a long, long way to go. And we know that we have less, less than 10% 10, 10 of heads of state are women. So that's still something to be uh, considered. But the, the OECD Secretary General candidacy has, has now a number of very... Uh, heavyweight women candidates in there. Australia also has a candidate who's not a woman, but uh, but I think the fact that they, there are high quality women in the field uh, vying for these decision making roles is is something we have to keep sight of and really and push for. Um, and I'm just um, just the, then the last thing I would want to just re reiterate and certainly certainly vehemently agree with Jane on is the importance 
the criticality of acting to end violence against women. Mm. And I, I think that that cannot, again, cannot be overstated. And, I mean, here in Denmark, there's quite an extraordinary set of um, um, circumstances coming out in terms of discussion around uh, sexual harassment in the workplace and in certain settings. And I, and I think it's distressing and it's difficult to do, but it's so important to have those discussions and recognise that this is happening, even in countries where we think we've dealt with gender equality and, and uh, you know, we think we've managed some of this stuff. We haven't. And these mm. things continue to happen and we must acknowledge them and we must look at the structural implications of them, not you know, I, I fear in some ways we have to we have to guard against being distracted by the personal and uh, you know the the, the sort of uh, high profile figure who might might be you know, resign and become something of a scapegoat. We've got to look at the at the structural barriers and cultures that are embedded there that in sh that continue to allow this to happen. And I think um, that's something that countries like Australia and Denmark have to continue to take very seriously and I know that they do but we have to we have to continue that and Excellent. and again I mean, violence against women prior to COVID was a horrible scourge and we know that we'll, it, it has you know escalated during this time so again we have to redouble our efforts to recognize that and prevent that um, Thank you. I think I think that's enough probably. Yeah, <laughs> that's fantastic. Thank you very much. And you've highlighted the what I call the pre-existing conditions, using the medical phrase, pre-COVID that have been exacerbated by the pandemic. And I think that's really, really important. Thank you very much indeed, Mary and Lina. Thank you. My Let's move over to uh, Berit. Berit, yes. um, would you like to make some Comments? Yes, thank you. First of all, I want to uh, thank Jean for a most inspiring lecture and Mary Ellen Miller for an excellent response and you Sue and Søren for organizing this. It's an honor to be invited and a possibility to learn and meet. As uh, you told us, Sue, Deakin University and Aarhus University have decided to become deep partners mm -hmm. as we share many of the same characteristics and values. And now we share the common big challenge of COVID. Uh, what I have already learned is that the COVID situation also has some positive effects. Nationally and among European universities, competition has been discharged largely and collaboration has been in the front when it comes to overcoming the detrimental effects of lockdown measures. And I'm very happy uh, that this approach to collaboration now also extends to other continents. Uh, at Danish universities, we have seen negative effects of the lockdown uh, measures, especially on research, production and collaboration and on students' well-being. Especially young women who are also mothers are suffering our master students, our PhD students, and our assistant professors who are trying to make uh, their way into a university position are challenged. And so are we, if we lose this pool of talent. We already really need more women in academia. Uh, I would like to make three um, reflections on what we have already heard, but, but first of all, uh, Jane, thank you so much for raising our attention to the gendered impact of COVID-19. I really have to say that there were issues that I was not uh, aware of. Uh, one uh, of my reflections is that we really need uh, special attention to junior and mid-career academic staff in the years to come. Even in a country with free education and publicly supported childcare, we need in the years to come to have a special attention to women as we are, as you told uh, Jane, really lacking women in tenure positions. Uh, I couldn't describe it more accurately than you already did. And I would also see in, in leadership. My second uh, point uh, is about students' well-being. It has been really hampered and following this lecture, I, I'm going to check up on our data we have collected uh, 
uh, survey data and, and data from, from uh, qualitative uh, research. Uh, and, and I have to look into if female students are uh, more uh, affected by the COVID situation, as we already see female students reporting a high degree of stress and uh, less well-being than their uh, fellow male students. And we need to find out if we have to have special attention on this also. And then one thing that I have been observing, but, but when you really uh, raised my attention about was this thing about expert females from academia really lacking in the media. We have seen many uh, and, and have been proud of some of the experts that we have supported the Danish society with. But we have also seen example virologists who have been talking about their field of expertise, but certainly also about uh, fields where they have no expertise. And I would think that this would not have been the same if, if uh, we had had more women, but you're absolutely right that uh, there has been a, a, an unproportionately high uh, number of, of, of male uh, drawn on uh, as experts. And I really think we have an obligation to raise the attention to this type of inequality. I'm, I'm ashamed that I haven't had the, the awareness, but at least now we can, can try to, to, to point to this. So these were the three areas where I think uh, we need uh, really to look extra uh, and, and where your uh, lecture has really given some, some uh, direction. So the junior and mid-career academic, the students' well-being and uh, how we make sure that uh, all the expertise we have already invested in and who could serve as role models for more women wanting to join uh, university careers. Mm -hmm. Uh, so thank you also for pointing forwards, but that will take too much to, to talk about the uh, reflections on that. <laughs>